Welcome to Shield of the Republic, a podcast sponsored by the Bulwark and the Miller Center of Public Affairs at the University of Virginia and dedicated to the proposition articulated by Walter Lippmann during World War II that a strong and balanced foreign policy is the shield of our democratic republic. I'm Eric Edelman, counselor at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, a Bulwark contributor, and a non-resident fellow at the Miller Center of Public Affairs at the University of Virginia. And I'm joined, as always today, by my partner in all things strategic, Elliot Cohen, the Robert Osgood Professor of Strategy at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and the Arlie Burke Chair in Strategy at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Elliot, happy Hanukkah. Well, happy Hanukkah to you too. I uh, spent a good part of yesterday grading 10 pounds of potatoes and onions for what ended up being some actually pretty wonderful latkes. And I do have a question for you, given that, you know, we're both celebrating Hanukkah for the obvious reasons. Favorite Christmas song? I'll tell you, I'll, I'll give you mine if you give me yours. Well, of course, I'm double dipping in our family since we have a very ecumenical family. Uh, so I've been listening to a lot of Christmas music over the last weekend. Um, uh, I, you know, I guess uh, my favorite is uh, in David City, actually, which is a, it's actually a, a hymn. So, I mean, and now if you want popular Christmas music, I mean, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, got to be. Well, okay. So, I, I mean, I'm lower brow than you you are. I uh, I say ding dong merrily on high, but with, you know, this is sort of a, uh, uh, I forget what's, what, what's the right phrase for this, but it's it's kind of a, a, a secret pleasure, uh, little drummer boy. Ah, there you go. Yeah. All right. But. In any case, it's mainly Mosaur, and we sing all the verses. So I'm actually, you know, through all my holiday party season, I have completed all the holiday activity until Saturday when we'll have the rest of our family over. This is meant to be a, a year-end roundup, which is the first time we've actually done that on Shield of the Republic, but it seems appropriate. This has been a pretty momentous this year, we've spent a lot of time on the show talking about Ukraine and Russia for good and sufficient reason. Uh, this is a very big deal in world historical terms. And it's also connected to a lot of the other things that we've talked about uh, during the course of the year on the show, uh, developments having to do with China and Taiwan and U.S.-China relations, their direction. Um, we recently had our friend Ray Take on the show talking about the upheaval going on in Iran. I, I noted today a story in the Financial Times about viral videos of Iranians knocking the turbans off clerics, all these videos going viral. I mean, we're now, I think, roughly at the 100-day mark in continuing protests uh, that show no sign of abating. So plenty um, plenty for us to talk about, Elliot. Um, let's, let's start with uh, Russia and Ukraine, and you've been following this closely, and you've been out to Kiev, you met with Zelensky, et cetera, who, by the way, is clearly my person of the year for whatever that's worth. I don't think it's even close uh, in my estimation, although I would give Liz Cheney honorable mention, but <laughs> we, we, could come back, we could come back to that. Where do you think this is going? You know, our friend Laurie Friedman had an article or uh, posted a long post on his substack about Russian security guarantees, giving Russia security guarantees. And that sort of follows from the comments that uh, President uh, Emmanuel Macron of France made about providing security guarantees to Russia. And then Henry Kissinger had a piece in The Spectator uh, a day or so ago, also proposing some kind of concert of Europe. I and mean, Fred Kaplan and Slate had a quite harsh takedown of, of Henry, but where is this all heading in your estimation? So, so uh, a few things just to start off with. First, no question about uh, Zelensky. You know, we're just as we're recording this, I see that he went right to the front lines at Bakhmut mm -hmm. to visit with the troops. And, you know, I think we should just pause for a moment and recognize that we're dealing with somebody who has not just risen to the occasion, which he has, 
But you know, who really is going to go down? I think as a major historical figure, simply as a war leader. Mm-hmm. You know that well, I I wrote a, a book on that subject, and one of the things that struck me about very good book, by the way. Well, thank you. Um, that what the all the great leaders did is they went to the front, and they went to the front for a number of reasons. Uh, partly to get the kind of feel that you can only get from being there, partly to show themselves to the troops, and partly to you know, give an example of courage. And courage, like cowardice, is contagious. And I think Zelensky gets that. And I, I do think he's an extraordinary leader. I also very much agree with you that this is a war which will prove to be enormously consequential. And uh, in fact, I think in some ways, it's the most consequential war of our, our lifetime. I think it's it's not only critical for Ukraine to win, it's critical for Russia to lose. And that, I believe, is the uh, the thing that uh, Henry Kissinger and others miss. Uh, for, first, I, I frankly, I find the idea of security guarantees to Russia obscene. You know, after they launch this evil war of conquest, replete with quite deliberate pillage and rape and torture and mass murder, the idea that we give guarantees to these people, I mean, it's like giving guarantees to the Germans after they invade Poland. I mean, it's just, it's, it's not just preposterous, it's disgusting. I think that where this war could easily end up going, I mean, it's a war, so you never can tell. It's not going to be stalemate. I do think at some point we're going to see Russia go through this period of internal chaos. You and I have discussed this before. Um, it's happened in Russian history repeatedly. For me, the key indicators are, uh, are the the emergence of these private militaries, uh, Prigozhin and the Wagner Group, uh, Kadyrov, of course, but also increasingly one of the things that I've seen reporting on, I don't know if you've followed this too, with the regional governors developing their own militias. And of course, you have the National Guard, which is its own thing. So once a country begins to have multiple armies, it's an indication that that the state is is coming unglued, but I'll just you know I'll stop by by saying my my view is really it's a, it's critical for Russia to be defeated as well as for Ukraine to be victorious. I think that's within our grasp, um, and I just hope that we are willing to really drive that one home. What am I bloodthirsty for your as usual? I mean I I'm largely in agreement. I I guess um, there are a couple of things uh, that occur to me first. Both the Washington Post and the New York Times have had really extensive uh, surveys of the terrible decision making by Russia during the first year of this war. And one of the things that's really striking is you already see anecdotal evidence of Russian forces turning on each other. In other words, there have been some examples of the Wagner and the regular army squaring off against uh, one another, different units squaring off against one another. And I think that is a kind of canary in the coal mine for what you're talking about later inside Russia itself. That's the kind of first thing. Uh, The second thing is, the one thing that worries me a little bit is uh, all this talk that you see, including coming from the Ukrainians, that the Russians are preparing another offensive, maybe from the north. You had Putin visiting yesterday with Lukashenko in Belarus. Russians have sent a lot of equipment to Belarus. Uh, They've done some training with the Belarusians. Both Lukashenko and the rest of the Belarusian military have been, to varying degrees, trying to stay out of this under great pressure from the Russians to get in. What do you make of all this talk? I mean, and there do seem to be other indications. Russians are moving some forces around above and beyond the continued kind of fruitless efforts around Bakhmut, they seem to be positioning some forces potentially for uh, kind of another go, if you will. What, what do you make of that? Well, I, you know, I, I'm like you, I'm puzzled. Uh, so our friends at the Institute for the Study of War, and actually it occurs to me at some point we should try to have Fred and Kim Kagan uh, on the show because they've, they've really put together a very, a very interesting operation that I think has been providing all of us with with a lot of insightful commentary. Absolutely, just terrific. They they really are. But but you know their their continued assessment is that this is not going to happen. And I, like you, I'm a little bit puzzled because the smoke signals coming up make it look that way. 
But I have to think if they tried that, they would fail again. You know, I mean, it would be, and, and I can well believe that, you know, Putin will try another roll of the dice. He, he's clearly a something of a gambler. And I think he may also be, you know, more profoundly out of touch than we realize. It, I'm sure it would be destructive, but I'm also sure that the Ukrainians would crush them. I mean, that, you know, the, we did, uh, on that trip that you mentioned, we went through Irpin, uh, which is one of the towns that they rolled through. And between the urban terrain and the forested terrain and the fact that the Ukrainians now are fully anticipating this, I have to think that, uh, you know, a, Rus a major Russian incursion would run into things that are very similar to what they experienced last time. And Lukashenko has to be concerned that this will blow back, not just from domestic opposition, but, you know, if the Ukrainians ever go on the counteroffensive, which we now know they are perfectly capable of doing, you could well see Ukrainian forces coming into Belarus, you know, triggering risings against the regime and so on. So I'm sure he's desperate not to do this. But I do think, I, you know, I don't mean to be sanguine because I, I do think they're we're entering a particularly dangerous phase of the war. And the, you know, my concern is not just what you mentioned, but you know, we both follow uh, Julia Davis's wonderful service of looking at the evening, yeah. these evening news shows, which are a lot more important there than they are here. And, and the thing that strikes me continuously and to actually to a growing degree is the hysteria. Oh, yeah. You know, if you listen to somebody like Vladimir Solovyov or Margarita Simonyan or really any of these ghouls and vampires, you know, they are they're talking very wildly about all kinds of things, whether it's it's everything from, you know, they're going to arrest all the street cleaners and send them to The Hague and we'll all go to jail. And uh, we need to blow up all the oil refineries in Azerbaijan to teach them a lesson. And, you know, Solovyov's last thing is, oh, I saw the, tro the troops at the front and they're ready to march to Berlin. Uh, and maybe that's what we'll have to do. And it just goes on and on. And I do worry about that because I don't think these are level-headed people. And I do think what, what you can hear creeping in is a note of desperation. And I think those people may actually have more sensitive antennae for obvious reasons to the possibility of that happening. So I do think we're entering a, a dangerous phase. My only thought is, A, it's not likely to end simply in a stalemate. And I think I do think there's a very good chance that it ends with some sort of major Russian crack up. What that turns into, you're probably you have a better feeling for than I do. Uh, but but I'll say one one other thing, which is, you know, the Western world, or at least the world that believes in liberty and rule of law, and you know, just the, the fundamental decencies that we take for granted, is owes an enormous debt to Ukraine. Uh, to the people of Ukraine, to their leaders, and they are fighting our fight. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why this is so consequential. And the, and the fundamental error that Kissinger and others make, and I'm, I'm going to be writing a piece about Kissinger's argument in a little bit, is I think it just so thoroughly shortchanges the moral dimension, the ethical dimension uh, the values dimension of international affairs, which is real, and you know, it's you're not goofy if you if you pay attention to those things. You're actually goofy if you think they don't count. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. I mean, you know, where this brings me back is to several things we've you know hit upon in this show previously. You know, if you look at the New York Times piece this weekend, the argument appears to be that. Putin is playing a long game. A senior NATO official unnamed is quoted as saying he's willing to lose three times the number of people in this war that he's already lost, which would put the losses well over 300,000. You know, at which point uh, you have to start wondering about, you know, does Russia have an army left to speak of at that point? And that he nonetheless seems to think that if he keeps kind of throwing bodies at this problem, which was a kind of classic Russian-Soviet way of uh, dealing with, you know, problems on the battlefield, uh, that he'll wear us down. He'll wear the West down. People will lose interest. I mean, there is some evidence, you know, that there is going to be some increased opposition in Congress. I think people have made too much of that, but, but there will be some tougher sledding and getting assistance to Ukraine, which is one reason why I think they've now got in the omnibus bill, I think the number is up to an additional 45 
billion to uh, add to what's already been provided to Ukraine, which would be a healthy number. But it seems to me the Biden administration needs to do a bunch of things it hasn't done. One president needs to explain all of this to the American people. Now, I know I've talked to some colleagues who say, no, 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 it's better that he doesn't, you know, it's better that the American people not know that this is going on, because if they knew it was going on, they might not support. I think that's not true. I think it's not supported by polling data. I I think he needs to frame this up uh, in the terms you and I have been talking about, both the interest and the moral piece of it, um, why it serves U.S. interests, why uh, essentially degrading Russian military power almost to zero at the cost of a hundred billion dollars is, is in fact, it's a cheap price to pay. It's a bargain. Um, and he needs to make that argument. I think, you know, second, I think the administration needs to be more forward leaning in pressing the allies, both privately and publicly to step up, to provide the economic budget support that Ukraine needs. I think their needs are something like 8 billion a month. Uh, the EU has not come close to, you know, hitting those kind of numbers, but they really need to do more. There are two sides to that debate. I mean, the Europeans have some complaints about uh, U.S. gas sales to Europe and the Inflation Reduction Act. Those, you know, I think the administration is trying to deal with, but they really need to push that because Americans, I think, will stand for a lot of military support for Ukraine, but I don't know that they will, over the long run, support you know, kind of continuing economic subvention of the Ukrainian economy. And I I would make it a formal position of the United States that the Ukrainian reconstruction is, you know, once we figure out how to do it, going to be financed by the frozen Russian assets. Yeah. Um, Uh, And then finally, the final piece of it is, and, you know, this is like, you know, you and I have been banging on this drum for a while, attack tanks. I mean, the Marines, I think, have about three to 500 Abrams tanks rusting at some depot somewhere. Why can't we provide them to the Ukrainians? The Gray Eagle uh, strike uh, UAVs. I mean, we need to start shoving all this stuff in because the quicker the Ukrainians can break through and retake a lot of the territory uh, and inflict more damage on the Russians, the better. Well, again, it's embarrassing how often we agree. Uh, it was ever thus. I, I guess my additional thought on that is, and maybe this can lead us into a somewhat broader discussion about American foreign policy, that although I give the Biden administration high marks uh, for how they handled the opening phase of this crisis, namely with the, the intelligence uh, leaks and so forth, And although I think they have gradually done the right thing, you know, increasing the quantity and quality of weapons too slowly to too limited a degree, but they've they've done it. Uh, And now they are ramping up some production of of some systems that we need again, you know, without the sense of urgency that I wish we had. You know, the the fact is, uh, I'll be really blunt about it. Uh, I mean, as you and I violently agree, he's a lot better than the previous guy, but Biden is still a mediocrity. Um, I will use that word. And he does not know how to give the kind of inspiring speech that is needed now. And it should be from behind the resolute desk uh, or you know, some, some similar venue. And it needs to be forceful. What strikes me about this actually is not that support is weakening, but it's amazing how how strong the support has been. And I think there are two reasons for that. One is the muscle memory from the Cold War, where the Russians were the bad guys, you know? And I was talking to a, I think I mentioned to you before, I was talking to a group of people who were about our age, and I asked if they remembered uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle with uh, (laughs) Boris Badenov. Yeah. Uh, But the other thing is, you know, the, the Russians, by their just continued barbarity, I mean, every day, a new outrage, a new onslaught against civilians, you know, they're doing the heavy lifting on selling the American people that this is a just, a just cause. But I agree with you, it's, it's not enough. And it, it does worry me somewhat that although the administration, you know, there are plenty of things to praise in, what, in administration policy. I think you and I will talk about China and, you know, there, I think they've been kind of reasonably good. And in other settings, in in other ways, 
they have it has not been the level of leadership that the moment uh that the moment demands and, and we saw that of course in afghanistan yeah uh, which was such a such a terrible disaster yeah no it's you know i feel you know much the same way i mean i would add to what you said about their management of uh the war so far I do give Secretary Blinken an uh, enormous amount of credit for doing the hard work of alliance management. I um, mean, he's been out there a lot, talking with the allies, keeping them on board, smoothing them over. You know, he's been peripatetic in that regard. And I give him high marks for that. I think he's done well. Uh, but, you know, it's just so dispiriting to read in the New York Times this business. You may have seen it that the Ukrainians might have been able to take a shot at Gerasimov when he. he oh, my gosh, I saw that. You know, and then the administration basically said, no, don't do that, because that might lead to a war between the United States and Russia. And I'm, I'm trying to think about, like, the mentality that that gets you to that. I mean, if the Ukrainians had killed Gerasimov on the battlefield. It would have been fantastic. Yeah. And how does that get how does that sort of get transmogrified into, oh, my God, it might lead to World War Three between the United States and and Russia, after all the general officers who the Ukrainians have already killed. I mean, well, or, or, you know, remember what we did to uh, Admiral Yamamoto during World War II, going after the opposing commander is a complete, this, by the way, okay, for those of you who aren't familiar, we arranged an aerial ambush, which killed Admiral Yamamoto, who had been the uh, the Japanese leader who had was commanding the Japanese fleet and had also commanded the Pearl Harbor operation. And it was done on the basis of signal intelligence, intercepts, and so on. But it, that's it's a completely legitimate thing to have done. No, I I, I agree. I think they, they, you know, the timidity at some level remains. But I, I would qualify it a bit. You know, I think you and I do ha- share the, the common American failing, which is to, to a li- maybe to a lesser extent than others, that we think it's really all about what we do. And it is in large measure about what we do. I mean, we that's, you know, the United States is the remains the uh, the dominant power. But what I'm struck by is actually the, how, all things considered, how impressive the Europeans have been. You know, they have not caved. I don't get a sense, yeah, there's discomfort. And they're suffering more, I think, from energy shortages and high uh, prices than we are. And, you know, they are pretty much sticking to things. I mean, you know, I wish the Germans were a lot better than they are and so forth, but. But they could be a lot worse. They could be, hey, listen, you know, come on, before the war, would you have anticipated any of this? No, no, absolutely. I mean, I think the irony here is that, you know, Vladimir Putin, when this is all said and done, when we were talking about the historic nature of this, you know, Vladimir Putin will end up, this is really Hegel's cunning of history, right? He will end up being the father of modern Ukrainian nationhood. Yes. And he will also be the father of Europe's green transition uh, away from che- you know, reliance on cheap Russian energy. And that, you know, in the end of the day will be, I think, a good thing for, for Europe and a good thing for the climate and, you know, uh, other things. So I want to... Can I? Yeah, please can go I ahead. Actually- yeah, I, can I, I wonder if I could take that and maybe move us on a little bit. I um, mean, I think you and I both think that Putin is failing one way or another. I mean, even if in some narrow sense they won a bit more in Ukraine, I, it's still a failure in terms of what the legacy is for the Russian state. And, you know, as you pointed out, the uh, Europe's attitude towards Russia and, and a lot more than that. Would you say that on the whole, this has been a bad year for the dictators uh, after us being apprehensive, quite apprehensive and legitimately apprehensive at the beginning of it. But if you think about, you know, the, the three bad, the th- three of the leading bad guys, there are others, Putin, Z, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, you know, plus some of the other sort of thuggish characters hanging around on the periphery, like former President Bolsonaro or Marine Le Pen and, and others. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, can you? Uh, I mean, the North Koreans, Kim Jong Un, seems immune to all this. Um, but, but, but then again, that's such a weird, isolated place, uh, although dangerous. Um, you know, can we make- he's becoming a model, right? He's becoming a model for Putin since Putin is yeah. now turning Russia into sort of 
a very large North Korea with a somewhat larger nuclear arsenal. But that, yeah, well, that, that's 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 a fair point. But but still, stepping back, cum grosso, uh, do you feel that on the whole, this has been a you know a worse year for them, a better year for us, and perhaps an indication of things to come in the future? Or do you think this is just part of the the normal perturbations of international politics? And uh, I'm wrong to take too much heart from that. No, I've taken a lot of heart from it. Our former colleague, Frank Fukuyama, has written about this and he's talked about the importance of this war globally for democracy. And this is in some way a, a, a vindication to some degree of the Biden administration's framing of American foreign policy as part of a, a, a systemic struggle between democracies and autocracies, authoritarian regimes. This has been a bad year for the authoritarians. Um, and I hate to use this term, but if we wanted to pivot right now to talk about uh, Asia and China, you know, this has been, I think, uh, you know, was meant to be a big year for Xi, where he would be, you know, crowned by the party Congress uh, with another term, you know, breaking the sort of informal norm of two terms, you know, since Jean Ziming turned it over to Hu Jintao. And, you know, uh, no sooner had that happened than you started to have this pushback by the Chinese public against uh, the COVID rules. But it, it seemed to me, based on what I've read, that it seemed a little bit more than just, you know, a pushback against the, the rules. There were a lot of cries of down with the dictator, which is also what we hear uh, from the Iranian public, you know, we, we can get to that in a minute. But uh, and Xi has had to, you know, sort of pull back on some of those COVID uh, restrictions in the face of this popular demand, which is, I think, uh, noteworthy. Certainly, in terms of the relationship between the Chinese Communist Party and and the uh, Chinese public. But moreover, he's kind of in a, a kind of a very awkward policy dilemma, right? Because loosening these restrictions, given the low uh, efficacy of Chinese vaccines and the fact that they refuse to use Western developed mRNA vaccines, you know, they're going to have a, a, a big upsurge of cases now that they've moved away from these lockdowns. And it's not clear how well their health systems can be able to cope with that. And it, it's, he's, he's, you know, moved away from the lockdowns in a way in order to move back towards a higher growth model since the lockdowns have impacted Chinese economic growth, but the ravages of COVID may impose, you know, similar or worse uh, economic consequences. So I, I think they're having a lot of trouble uh, wrestling with this. And as all authoritarian regimes tend to find out, you know, if, you, if you're not uh, very nimble and if you can't adjust, uh, it's a huge problem for you. Let me maybe push further than that and in some measure disagree in that part of Z's problem is not that he hasn't been nimble enough. He he just became way too nimble. I mean, it's not just loosening the restrictions. He just lifted all of them. Right. So, you know, there it's now bloody chaos and they're about, they are in the middle of a, you know, a, a, a ferocious epidemic, which is going to see, you know, people have said maybe even millions of people dying. Uh, who knows? I, I think I, I I would also push further in this way. I think one of the things that I've always believed about being in a position of power is that after a while, it's like, you know, getting cataracts very rapidly. Your ability to perceive reality uh, diminishes. It gets, you know, more and more blurry. You're not seeing things straight. You know, in, in the West, we have an operation for that. They're called elections. Uh, and then you get a new set of leaders who then, you know, get their chance to become unrealistic about the world around them. But that's not what dictators have. And I think particularly for, for a whole bunch of reasons, partly because they're in power longer, partly because the nature of those systems is it reinforces sycophancy. Mm -hmm. uh, it diminishes your ability to hear bad news. You know, the result is they get more and more detached from reality. And I think, you know, in the, just in the case of those three countries we've talked about, you see that, you know, Putin clearly unable to hear any of the people around him who clearly would have liked to have said, this is a terrible idea, boss. Uh, Z having, you know, he 
taken a meat axe to his own high tech uh, industry by going after Tencent and Jack Ma and Al- Al- people Al- like that. And then the uh, the Iranian regime, you know, just being so utterly out of touch with it's, it's not just the the urban elites, but clearly these protests have been around the country, and in particular, you know, women who just have had it. And and I think you know we're we're seeing all those come together now. Can they adapt? I don't know. Can they beat some of this down by sheer repression? Uh, maybe for a time, but but I I do think that their weak fundamental weaknesses have been on display um, in a very vivid way, and that that's that's really important for us as well because um, you know the weaknesses of democracy are always on vivid display, and people like us talk about them all the time, and we talk a lot less about our internal strengths, which are also enormous. Yep, I agree. You know, the other thing, of course, is that the war that Putin has unleashed has caught up both China and Iran to some degree. And both of them, I think, see some potential benefit in it, but also enormous dangers for them. And I think they're both wrestling with, you know, with how to do it. So, I mean, obviously, in the case of China, Putin had just, Putin and Xi had just declared, you know, this limitless partnership, which almost immediately has been tested and seems to have some limits, actually. I mean, it's not, you know, clear how much the Chinese want to be associated with with this effort. It's clear they've been pushing back, certainly on things like potential use of theater nuclear weapons. but. Um, they don't seem to, for instance, have provided much, if any, lethal assistance to the Russians. Uh, what other assistance they're giving is a little bit opaque. But even the Iranians, although they're providing them with these Shahid-136 and 131 drones and these uh, Mojahir drones, they uh, have also been at pains to deny that they're doing it. Now, part of that is because it would violate the UN Security Council resolution that Part of it is just the habit of lying. Part of it's lying. Part of it's habitual lying. Part of it is, you know, it would be a violation of the UN Security Council resolution that implemented the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Agreement back in 2015. And so, uh, you know, they they don't want to be hit with the consequences of of that. So, yeah, I'm sorry, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. It's a mouthful. Um, (laughs) I should have just stuck with JCPOA. It would have been safer. So, you know, this is a, a problem for them too. And and it's one of the reasons why defeat of Russia is, is so important because the message it would send to these other two. Well, the message, message it would send to them, the message it would say to the good guys around the world, you know, the to the, say, our allies in the Indo-Pacific where, you know, it's quite interesting. The Japanese are, seem to be going for quite a striking uh, increase in their defense spending up to 2% of GDP, which is actually a little bit more than that because, the, as you know, the Japanese accounting system is different than ours. And there are things that we put in our defense budget, which they don't put in theirs. But but let me ask you the, this question, Eric. If things are kind of going our way or going the way of the liberal democracies, and if the dictators are on a bit of the back foot, particularly with regard to China... Do you think that there's a, a, a really increased danger that they will try something on Taiwan? And what's what's the nature of that? And I, I guess my, my gut feeling is there is a significantly increased danger, uh, partly because, you know, of some of the things we've talked about, partly because I think they probably see a window and Z probably sees a window closing. He's, an, he's another aging dictator. Uh, who wants to make his mark on history? I think they're, you know, you're now seeing these a uh, number of reputable um, students of the Asian economy saying, you know, actually they're never really going to match American GDP. Uh, they're caught in the, the classic middle income uh, trap. They've got, you know, all kinds of issues. Um, do, do you are you anxious about that? I mean, we, we've been so focused on Russia Ukraine that uh, I think some some of our listeners may feel that we're you know, missing the really big issue, which is in Taiwan. the Indo-Pacific. We last summer did have Mike Beckley and, and Hal Brands on um, 
talking about whether the window was moving closer rather than further away. Michael and Hal, you know, basically argue that uh, this is not a problem for the 2030s, as a lot of people had thought, but really one for maybe, you know, not even the later part of this decade, but, you know, you know, closer to the middle part in three or four years. Before I answer the question, let me say what I think we ought to do about it. <laughs> sort of backwards, I know, but um, look, I think we need to be maximizing our assistance uh, to Taiwan and doing everything we can to help Taiwan. There is a lot in this NDAA that was just uh, passed uh, for Taiwan, I think something like $10 billion worth. But as you know, uh, we have to get out of our own way because we have a huge backlog of military assistance to Taiwan that hasn't gotten there for a variety of uh, infuriating bureaucratic reasons. I think we need to be pushing Taiwan a lot harder than we have to do the things they need to do to defend themselves as well as doing the things we need to do to put ourselves in a better position if a push comes to shove. Because ideally what you want to do here is make this so unappealing to Xi and to the Chinese military that in the end of the day, he doesn't you know, want to, and you know, he wake, doesn't wake up and say, today's the day I want to invade Taiwan. I mean, that, that really is the, the key issue, I think. In that sense... You know, I think the uh, Ukraine war has been a huge, great wake-up call for us. So on um, something you've talked about, and we've talked about many times on the show, munitions. Um, you know, munition stocks are something that always got shorted at the end of the year when, you know, budget accounts got reconciled in the Department of Defense. Uh, we called attention to that in 2018 in the National Defense Strategy Commission report that I co-chaired with uh, Admiral Gary Ruffhead, the former chief of naval operations. Um, we almost ran out. We called attention to the fact in 2018 that in 2015, we'd almost run out of munitions uh, in the uh, counter ISIL fight. I mean, to show how uh, influential and important these commission reports are, of course, no one paid any attention whatsoever to the recommendation. Nothing happened. But people have got the message now in the Pentagon and in defense industry and on the Hill. And I think something will be you know, done about that to increase our ability to mobilize the defense industrial base, which we, you know, haven't really, something we haven't talked about uh, really in 40 or 50 years. Um, yeah, I, that's absolutely critical. You know, I, I mean, I, one of the point I've, I've um, tried to make a number of times go, going back quite a while, uh, including in a book I, I published about seven years ago, The Big Stick, is thinking about mobilization used mobilization used to be an essential component of the American uh, military posture, really going back, indeed going back to colonial times. And the assumption was always the forces in being would never really be enough. And uh, no, we thought ma about mobilization mainly in personnel terms, but really, you know, beginning in the 20th century, we also included thinking about the industrial base. And I think you know, you've raised two distinct issues. One is the stockpiles, where you're absolutely right that we've shortchanged those for a long time, although not nearly as much as other countries have. But the other thing is the, the industrial base side of it, which, which is different, which is the ability to, you know, as rapidly as possible, you know, dramatically increase the amount of stuff you're producing. And it's a lot harder to think about that, you know, for the, the stockpiles, you just buy more stuff and, you know, you, so you can do that, but being prepared to generate a lot more military power out of current production, I think is a very different, very different matter. It's different than it was during world war two when, you know, we did astoundingly well at it. Yeah, different um, kind of production, you know, very different. Kind of yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, two things there, I would say. One is, you're right. I mean, we're suffering here because of the shrinkage of the defense industrial base uh, after the end of the Cold War. You know, we went from a very large number of firms doing business in this sector to a much smaller number and a, a very small number of primes, a handful, really, and then a much smaller number of subsidiary firms that provide inputs to, to the primes. And so as a result of that, we have 
two different problems that we have to deal with in terms of you know mobilizing the defense industrial base to max out production of some of these high-end munitions, which we've run down like stingers and javelins and uh, gimmelers for the attack on, uh, from, excuse me, for the uh, HIMARS. We haven't started running down the attackums, but one reason I would say that there's hesitancy in the Department of Defense, you know, some of it's got to do with escalation risk. Some of it's got to do with uh, people in the Pentagon and the military services not wanting to run down these stocks of what we used to call in when we were in government, we would have called them low density, uh, high value items. Which, which as Don Rumsfeld used to say, it just means we, we didn't buy enough of them. We didn't buy enough of them, right. So, By the way, you, you, you and I first met, we, we were present at the constriction, if you think about it that way. I mean, when you and I first met uh, in uh, back in 1989, 90, that's yeah. That, that's when that was beginning to happen. And I vividly remember that people say, oh, this is great. Northrop and Grumman are going to uh, merge, merge. And, you know, and a number of these other primes are going to disappear. And uh, there was just no thought given to that, to the possibility that you really needed a big, healthy uh, industrial base and that, you know, it was going to bound to be very difficult to do, but that you should struggle somehow to to try to maintain it. I think people just stopped. They they just stopped thinking about it. By the way, you know, one one thought that did occur to me though, as you were talking just now, a a side benefit of you know this awful war is shows shows us that actually Western and and particularly American, but not just American military hardware is really good. Yeah, I mean, HIMARS is, is a good system. Yeah, uh, you know, the M seven 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 howitzers. That that's a good artillery piece, and and you know some of the European stuff is even better. The Cesar is a good artillery piece, and and, and and the thing is, those if you look at that technology, it's, this is not you know twenty twenties technology. A lot of it is really late twentieth century technology, although updated and improved and all but, that. But the way, um, but the accuracy of those systems and the targeting data is facilitated by pretty high tech uh, yes. equipment. Um, that uh, is now actually being tested on the battlefield. Just to tie off the defense industrial base mobilization piece, though, the, the two long poles in the tent are floor space because there's not enough of it to produce all these munitions. And uh, in particular, the major element is, uh, you know, recruitment of right. uh, a highly skilled, uh, technically, technically proficient workforce and industry, understandably, because they're driven by the bottom line, not by command, you know, they are reluctant to invest in both of, you know, bringing on a lot of workers who they then have a lot of overhead to, to deal with. And also the expansion of the floor space. So what's going to be needed is some combination of throwing a lot of money at the problem, um, but also long-term contracts that incentivize defense industry to create that resilient industrial base that, that we can draw on. But yes, I mean, to go back to your point, you know, the quality of our equipment is very, very good. And this is one reason to get back to where we started in this part of the conversation, why I'm not sure the Chinese necessarily will end up, whatever their initial inclination right. might be, to move the timeline up for invading Taiwan. I mean, they might, and we certainly need to be prepared for it because we want to do everything we can to discourage it and deter it. But as they look at this war, they've got a lot of things to, you know, worry about. I mean, you know, one of the things they have to worry about is the fact that most of their military kit is either based on or uh, stolen from Russian designs. And, you know, secondly, um, although Xi has... Uh, made it a point uh, as part of his process of accumulating political power to try and root out corruption in the uh, People's Liberation Army. There seems to have been quite a bit of it, you know. So uh, whether you've got as much rot as you had inside the Russian system, don't know, but not sure Xi wants to find out, you know, on the battlefield. Third, you know, these are difficult operations and what they would have to contemplate going up against, yes. you know, Taiwan, an amphibious operation over a fairly 
you know, it's it, they're close, you know, to to uh, China. Taiwan's close to China, but still moving that distance over over open water. Combined arm, arms operations are hard. Uh, yeah. You know, we got very very good at it, and you know, made some people I think think, oh well, anybody can do this. Well, no, not anybody can do it, mm-hmm. particularly if you don't pay attention to the logistical piece of it. So there's a lot they have to, and then not to mention the fact that they, you know, their military has actually never fought anybody that's been shooting at them since yeah. 1979. And when they did that against the Vietnamese, they didn't perform all that well. Now, admittedly, it's a very different military today than it was in 1979. But still, the lack of combat experience has got to induce, I think, some kind of caution in in uh, Chinese military leaders, particularly as they watch what's happening to to the Russians. So look, that's not dispositive. Um, you know, they, they might, you know, say, well, we still have some advantages now before the Americans get geared up. So let's go now. There's always that kind of logic that you have to work against, but that's one reason why we have to have a very high sense of urgency about Taiwan and making sure that we're doing everything we can to make sure they don't draw those conclusions. Well, you know, from, from, from your mouth to uh, Z's ear, I guess the only thing I would add to that is I, I tend to think that's exactly why they will not go for a sort of an Iwo Jima style um, assault. But, you know, we don't have a whole lot of time left. And I, I, I mean, we should certainly talk about our own country. But uh, before that, we haven't done really much this year on the Middle East. And let me just tee that off and then get your responses. I think on the one hand, with the the Abraham Accords really are the kind of most dramatic manifestation of a profound change, which is that in in many ways the classical Arab Israeli conflict is just over. Uh, there's an Israeli Palestinian conflict which is about to get a lot worse, I believe, with the new Israeli right wing government and um, a whole set of internal problems, and that could play out in other ways. Uh, the Middle East is in many res- in some places just a horrific mess, like. Syria and some place, a kind of a contained mess. I suppose you could say that perhaps about Egypt. You have a new generation of leaders, particularly in Saudi Arabia, which is a little bit, which is not entirely reassuring. I guess my you didn't even mention Yemen. Well, exactly, and and you know, and then you have the 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 possibility. I mean, I I wish it were a probability. Maybe it is of the the whole system being upended if there's a real upheaval in Iran. You know, if that regime went down, all of a sudden the Middle East would be a very different place. So I'm just curious to know, how how do you think we should think about uh, the Middle East from the point of view of American foreign policy, Eric? Well, I think we have to resist the tendency, which I understand, uh, which is to take the position that the Middle East should return to the obscurity it so richly deserves and that we should just ignore it. I don't think we can ignore it. I mean, I I worry a bit, you know, that both the last administration with its national defense strategy, this administration have basically said, you know, priority is Russia and China. And I totally agree with that. But the idea somehow that we can take risk in the Middle East, you know, I I think has already been disproven. I mean, I I think the um, disaster in Afghanistan had knock-on consequences. You know, I, one of them was that it almost certainly figured into, I can't prove this, but it almost certainly figured in Putin's calculations uh, in the fall of 2021 about what he was going to do in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, it did enormous reputational damage to the United States with our allies. We've overcome some of that, but not necessarily all of it. I worry, for instance, that the situation in Syria is not totally stable in the sense that we no longer are uh, operating in a major way in Iraq. We still have some very limited forces in Syria. The Turks are threatening to go in and go after uh, the folks with whom we've been allied, the SDF in northeastern Syria in the counter ISIS fight. And I don't think you can rule out that you could have a repetition of what you had in 2014 when the Iraqi security forces collapsed uh, and you had this major expansion of ISIL creation of a caliphate in Mosul and Raqqa, which then took a lot of time and effort on the part of the United States working with Iraqi partners and uh, Syrian partners to, to destroy that caliphate and eliminate it. 
Uh, that was a big accomplishment, actually. But I mean, I nothing would up, upend our effort, for instance, to you know refocus all of our attention, as you and I have just been discussing on Taiwan, than an event like that, which would requir- require us to put much more emphasis and resources into the Middle East. So I think it's one of these things that we can't ignore. We can't walk away from it much as we would like to, uh, as attractive as that is. When we do that, I mean, that was the underpinning, really, of Biden's decision to pull out of Afghanistan. Right. You know, and when we do that, bad things happen and, and bad forces fill the vacuum we create. You know, uh, I mean, the way I think about the Middle East is, uh, to paraphrase Trotsky, you may not be interested in the Middle East, but the Middle East is interested in you. Or to kind of flip a uh, well-known commercial uh, on its head, what happens in the Middle East doesn't stay in the Middle East. I, I, you know, I think that the larger point here, in a way, is that because uh, of what was always an excessive focus on the Arab-Israeli conflict as the only important dynamic there, you know, we now heave a sigh of relief when it returns to normal or semi-normal geopolitics, forgetting how how destabilizing that can be. And actually, I think you've got two different dynamics, both of which could be quite problematic. First, you know, the, the the fundamental societal collapses that we saw in places like Syria and Libya, overtones of it in uh, Egypt, I would say in, in Yemen as well, um, that that or Lebanon would be another example that that remains and that that is can be profoundly dangerous. But on the other hand, you also have states playing a geopolitical game. One subject that I we don't have time to go into today, but we really need to go into, particularly given the fact that you were the ambassador there, is the role of Turkey, because it, you know it seems to me the Turks are playing a very interesting role, sometimes constructive, but. But you're really seeing the emergence of a Turkish power under Erdogan that is quite ruthlessly playing the geopolitical game and in ways that, as I said, some of which could be constructive and some of which will be could conceivably be very dangerous. And we need to we should be exploring that. I agree. Since we have we have so little time left, I think, you know, before you and I give our our farewell salutations to this year. What about our own country? I mean, you and I were two of the original never Trumpers. You and I are both short term pessimists, long term optimists about this country. Uh, I think that there there are deep reasons for that. How are, how are you feeling? I mean, I, I, I frankly, I'm feeling a lot better. I think you know it does look like Trump's on the way out. I wish Biden wouldn't run for reelection, and we had another generation of both Republicans and Democrats stepping forward, but. Um, you know, what's your take? Well, the late political scientist V.O. Key had a, a great aphorism, in which he said, I believe in the sober second thought of the American voter. You know, and I, I think American voters, you know, by and large have been, you know, relatively kind of consistent and stable. They've been sort of kind of, I would think, inclined just, you know, mildly to the center right. Uh, what the historian Marvin Myers, when writing about the Jacksonians, called venturesome conservatives. I mean, that's sort of the, I think, the kind of center of gravity of American politics. I think it reasserted itself in the last election cycle. I mean, you know, if you look at how the voters behave, I mean, look, there are some elections that came out in ways I wish they hadn't. I mean, I I, I don't relish the idea of, of you know, a Peter uh, Thiel puppet you know, in the Senate in the form of J.D. Vance. But by and large, I think, you know, most election deniers were defeated. The Democrats held the Senate. The the terrible, awful candidates foisted on the Republican Party, largely by Donald Trump, but not just by Donald Trump, uh, were defeated. Almost all of them except, the, you know, the, one of the things that I found very striking, with the exception of Kerry Lake, just about all of them accepted the uh, the election outcome. Yeah, you know, that, and, and that's I, I, unfortunately it's a big deal when that happens, but it is a big deal, and including Herschel Walker, uh, which you know was a big, uh, big surprise. So all of that, you know, is to the good. I still worry about the political, even even if Trump is on the decline, which he certainly is if you look at the polls. I, I remain concerned, first of all, though, that we haven't heard the last of him and since you and I lived through 2016, you know, a divided Republican field 
he still has a base of support that's pretty, pretty given everything that's happened in the last two years, all the revelations, everything that the January 6th committee has uncovered, the corruption of his uh, company that's been uncovered by prosecutors in New York State. I mean, all of this, the fact that he still has about a third of the Republican electorate in thrall, you know, is still worrisome. And given the kinds of opponents he's likely to have, I mean, there's a danger of a fragmented field again, which allows him to emerge. But also, I think the party is not healthy. They're just a lot of unhealthy sort of currents running through the party, most of which he's let loose in the America first, the xenophobia protectionism, all of those things, you know, have always been present in the Republican Party. Trump really took the lid off. And so I worry that, you know, it's going to take several more election cycles, you know, before the party can get healthy. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think it's going to be a, a decade or more. And the fact of the matter is the country's in the middle of huge cultural, socioeconomic kinds of changes, uh, which I think will, will feed, feed all that. But I think, uh, you know, I, I fundamentally have, and I know you share the belief that we have an amazing uh, constitutional structure that was put together by a brilliant generation a quarter of a millennium ago. And we, you know, it's still the land of promise that brought my grandparents here and yours mm-hmm. uh, that, you know, brought our producer here. Um, I mean, this is, uh, you know, it remains an extraordinary country and above all a country with extraordinary resilience. I think we're, we're, we're pretty much at the end. So I'm just going to conclude by, um, a word of thanks. Actually, it's to you, Eric, because, uh, when you first approached me about this idea of doing a podcast together, you know, I'm still wrapping my head around the internet. Uh, <laughs> and the idea, the idea of doing a podcast, I don't know. I wasn't quite sure. And I wasn't, and, and I, I was, well, well, will there be enough to talk about? There's loads to talk about. Uh, hopefully in the next year, we'll be doing this even more frequently with even more guests. But I just want to thank you because it was a great idea. I, I know our, our, because we hear from them, that our listeners enjoy it a lot and find it beneficial. And uh, But I have to tell you, I just enjoy it. And I look forward to our conversations, which I believe will be happening more frequently. We've got big plans for uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. next year. I'm glad you feel that way. I'm very glad we uh, got this started. I think we really uh, need to uh, say a word of thanks to two other people, uh, Shea Katiri, our producer, who, without whom this podcast would not have happened. Um, it was a twinkle in my eye, but uh, he turned it into a reality. So a shout out to Shea and a thanks to him for that and to Robert Davis Edelman, who does our sound production and makes both you and me sound so much better on Shield of the Republic than we do in real life. So I'm, I'm grateful to him. We, I, we are uh, going to be going to a more uh, frequent format for those uh, listeners who've been asking for more. You're going to get it whether you want it or not now. So that's a great thing. We will start the year uh, with Peter Baker and Susan Glasser, who will be our guests in the very first show of 2023, talking about uh, their really fascinating and, if not depressing, uh, book, The Divider, about uh, the Trump presidency, which I would say, I'm not sure if you agree, Elliot, but, you know, the old saw is that journalists write the first draft of history. I think this is really one of the first books I've read about the Trump presidency that really qualifies. They are both really good. I should add just one, one other thing, which is if there's enough demand out there, uh, I have been pushing hard for Shield of the Republic swag. <laughs> We're working so, on that. So maybe maybe in the next year we'll we'll actually have something so uh, you know we can demonstrate and our listeners can demonstrate uh, just how how much this podcast means to all of us. So happy New Year! Same to you. Same to all of our. Our listeners, whether you are celebrating Christmas or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa, however you celebrate, wishing you a very happy holiday season and a healthy new year. Uh, We'll be back after the new year. And in the meantime, if you have questions and comments, you can send us an email at shieldoftherepublic at gmail.com or wherever you get your podcasts, uh, go on and uh, leave a review 
Give us a like on Apple or Spotify or wherever you get them. And we'll be back after the first of the year. <laughs>